purpose of today's call is to give you a general overview to, to give you a sense of what we're seeing uh, in macro. I am today at uh, FFA, FFA, Future Farmers of America, holds a convention each year. Uh, some of you have been in FFA. It essentially is a youth development program associated with farmers. Uh, there are uh, almost a million members of FFA right now and kids in high school focused on really what the future of agriculture will be. And the future of agriculture is not, as we talk through all the people that we're meeting with, is not about just growing wheat. It is about data sciences, it's about nutritional benefit, it's about feed conversion ratio. It is a very detailed technical topic as as complex as my background in aerospace and as complex as anything that's going on in tech. We'll cover some of that today. We are after three macro themes. These are immovable giant macro topics that are affecting our market. If you're paying attention to venture capital, you don't really want to chase the new thing. What you really want to pay attention to is giant macro themes that are causing a transition in the marketplace. In venture capital, your expectation is that many of our behaviors are going to stay consistent, uh, but then we're going to use new technology to be more productive. The, the largest and most dominant topic in our investment thesis is around the area that we spend 1.7 trillion on food in the US, 1.9 trillion on the healthcare costs of poor nutrition. We're going to talk about Ozempic today. Probably several of our investors are on Ozempic, but the influence of Ozempic and new drugs is, is important in the context of what's going on with nutrition and really drives a large part of our market. We see that the 1.7 trillion we spend on food and the 1.9 we spend on healthcare costs related to poor nutrition that most of that 1.9 is really uh, waste and repair and can be moved over uh, really into uh, better health uh, through both food and other lifestyle changes. And each one of those creates a huge opportunity for investment when we think about a global population. The overall population is growing by 2050 and by 2 billion people. Uh, the people here at FFA today who are in fifth grade are gonna be the leaders of, of that world and, and trying to feed 2 billion more people. That is gonna make a giant shift in demand for protein. Many of us get protein from meat. It'll cause a shift in how we get that protein from other products, whether that's alternative meats or alternative sources of protein. So there's a lot of a landscape there where you gotta feed 2 billion more people and that's gonna require a technology shift. And then there are additional concerns about uh, if we are doing this growing, if we are running agricultural practices, uh, the food processing and all of that does create negative externalities in terms of environment. And we're really seeing through regenerative agriculture that there's an ability to actually certainly produce food without waste. And many of our companies touch that in some fashion to help drive it. But these themes are there. They're not going away. It doesn't matter what tomorrow's market is doesn't matter that things like the alt meat market is in disruption. The global demand of these systems requires that we increase production output, which requires productivity and therefore requires innovation. I uh, GLP-1, so Ozempic and Wacovi, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, are drugs that, that really reduce your appetite. They do it in a particular way that is a, a fairly convenient through an injection uh, and essentially what they do is they make it so you want to eat less calories. They really don't do anything to improve calorie your your diet nutrition wise. One might consider them a sort of drug induced starvation. It's not much different than going on a calorie restricted diet but not having hunger pains. These drugs cost about $1000 a month to deliver uh, and they really aren't sustainable in the long term. It would cost more than a trillion dollars for the U.S. economy to address and use uh, these GLP-1s, uh, but they have taken the market by storm, enough so that it's actually affecting Nestle and companies like that, where they're being asked to report if so many people are going to go on these drugs and their diets are going to reduce caloric intake, is Nestle going to be reporting lower quarterly earnings in the future? Much of what we have talked about in, in iSelect and many of the 70 investments that we have made all relate in some fashion to improving nutritional density. 
uh, as sort of a refinement to the food system. It's sort of a geeky kind of term, but it really means uh, that right now when you go into the grocery store, you get fat. In the future, you can walk into the grocery store, buy healthy, tasty food that's addictive, so to speak, that it's tasty, that actually will reduce your weight or keep your weight in balance. And so there's a shift going in that direction. And while the CPG industry has been a little bit slow to move away from ultra processed food, the additional pressure of things like Ozempic, where Nestle's being asked, the drug companies are making $1,000 a month to transform the diet for your clients, your customers, are you going to do anything different? And we're already starting to see that shift at places like Nestle and Mars, where they're really turning back to our portfolio companies. This has been our thesis since 2014, and we're starting to see it move forward. And I'd keep an eye on it because it's a it's an important trend. When we look at the landscape of what's going on in food is health overall, the you know the Ozempic and GLP ones are disrupting that food landscape as I discussed. We've also seen an evolution in in the conversations around environment. There, uh, certain part part of the population is importantly focused on this as an issue, uh, and what we're starting to see is a shift to food is health and nutrition density, in which people are sort of saying, well, if if we make it so that we get more protein per bushel, you know, for 50 years, we've been focused on yield per acre in production across 300 million farmland acres in the United States. We've been focused on uh, yield per acre. But what's starting to happen is we're moving to a concept of, uh, I, I'm i Matt Moreland, I'm a farmer in Oklahoma, I farm 7,000 acres of wheat, I can regeneratively grow that wheat at a lower cost profitably and also deliver more nutrition. And I can get a premium in the marketplace uh, for that. And my crops are more resilient. So we're moving to this notion that that by optimizing towards nutrition density, we impact the environment in a positive way. We also build a better product. And that product is appealing to consumers because it, it improves their health and therefore longevity. So the, the market is sort of shifting in that direction to try to optimize it all. We're starting to see what we refer to as verticalization. So some people have seen this in the Costco six pound chicken in which Costco decided to disintermediate Tyson and go directly to producers and work with producers. We're starting to see that with Nestle going directly to producers to, to get regenerative wheat. And we are likely to see that in other areas. Fairlife is another example. If any of you drink Fairlife milk, it's a fairly novel milk that tastes really good. It's lactose, uh, doesn't cause lactose intolerance and really has turned into about a billion dollar brand out of a milk co-op. So we're starting to see an evolution of the business models there. Nestle and Pepsi are moving away from what they were doing in, in ESG in terms of carbon offsets, buying trees in Brazil to offset their footprint. And they're starting to look inside the supply chain. McDonald's is very, very active and going up and down their supply chain, trying to understand what practices are being used and making sure the best practices are used so that the, even the McDonald's delivers food that's got better nutrition in it because they see the younger generation moving in that direction. A large Wall Street bank has uh, started to work with a major client to spend a billion dollars to buy up farmland and optimize it using the best technology. I select as the source of those kinds of technologies. We really are the technology roadmap to this world. Uh, we're starting to see in the Middle East pressure around what's referred to as food security. And really what that means is China's pretty big and it's grabbing food out of the Sudan. We're in the Middle East. How are we going to offset and compete against China's power? Is this going to become a military issue or, or can we come up with better food systems and so we're starting to see the Middle East come into the U.S. market to invest. Uh, but we're also pressured by what's going on in the venture market. We're in a lull in the venture market. We're an all-time low in terms of the last 20 years in terms of venture allocation. iSelect continues to raise money, uh, though it's a little bit lower. We, we have been raising money while other venture firms have been shutting down because they can't raise money. Uh, Trailhead Capital, though, recently did open up a new fund of about $50 million, Payne Schwartz, which is a later stage fund, uh, a $1.7 billion fund. So we're in a world where increased interest rates move markets and move money away from venture capital. There's starting to be a shift back into venture capital, and we see those in terms of the macro markets. How that affects iSelect is iSelect is dependent. We can't do it all alone. 
And so we are dependent on other investors to co-invest with us. And this year has been tough in that regard. A lot of the co-investors that invest with us have been licking wounds and sort of thinking through what's going on. The advantage from a portfolio standpoint is we can buy into companies at a lower price. The disadvantage is it's harder for us to exit right now. Uh, we have about eight companies that are in discussions about exits. We thought those would occur by the end of 23. Uh, they are more likely to occur through 2024 as people sort of sort through the economy and figure out what they're going to do with cash. Exits at this point are much more likely to occur through acquisition than IPO. We still have a lot of macro issues in the marketplace that we have always seen. You know, if you go back to 2000, Amazon was almost wiped out. Google was almost wiped out. But because of the way the markets moved, but markets turn around and quality companies excel. And, and that's what our expectations. So with venture capital, we're never quite sure about the timing of things, but if we stay on path in terms of the fundamental macro need, we've got to deliver a lot of food to a lot of people over the next 20 years. That sort of long-term advantage is, is really what the, what the dynamic is. Uh, as I say, we can't pick the time that the money comes back, but we can make sure that we're focused on the thesis that matters, and we are. Which leads us a little geeky here for those people that that pay attention to numbers. Uh, for years, really, the the thesis around the food concept has really focused that through genetics, through issues in the environment, and through land management, we can improve yield. And this was important. Uh, the coming out of nineteen forty five. The Marshall Plan and such focused on how do we really scale nutrition so that tyrants cannot use famine as a means to control populations. And we've been successful. 2010, we produced more calories in the world than we need. What's starting to happen is the shift to nutrition in which through genetics, environment, and management, we affect yield and nutrition. And the sort of simplification of, of the complexity of what we do sort of brings clarity I had a conversation today, walking in the hall with the head of Indiana's School of Ag, and really talking about how they are starting to integrate the School of Ag in with the Department of Nutrition and with their med school to really sort of optimize this and how they are using that to with their students to strengthen their students' ability to control their health. And so this topic is it will continue to extend, and this is really sort of the fundamental uh, math behind what we're doing, but is uh, some new thinking that we're we're oriented around. Uh, what we expect is going to be going on in the market here is is that we're going to see really a lot of this pressure in terms of the macro healthcare costs. The president is thinking of spending twenty five billion dollars on Ozempic under Medicare Part D. That's one of the largest expenditures for a single drug they've ever considered. We've got the protein push and climate pressure. Uh, so that we the the market's moving into that sort of ozempic mindset of can I use health care to solve the obesity problem and improve nutrition? Uh, that will then put pressure on the CPGs, and we're already starting to see that the Nestle's of the world to innovate and really come up with food solutions that are better than ozempic, which exist. That pressure will go on to ADM, where an ADM and a Cargill and a Bungie have been very focused on on commoditization, they'll see their markets open up in which somebody like a Nestle is very more specifically looking for nutritional density. We're starting to see that happen across all of the ADMs and the Bungies, and, but that'll be a struggle for them to make that shift. That's a change for their business plan. Regenerative farming is going to move uh, away from the sort of environmental focus to a nutritional density focus. We're already seeing the best producers out there, people who run 20,000 acre farms, rethink about how to use regenerative practices, that the, the application of things like Kula Bio, which is our portfolio company, helps them reduce their synthetic fertilizer and both in wet and hot seasons actually gives them more resilience for yield and also produces a crop that has a, a more nutritional intensity. We'll be using companies like Audacious, which is a portfolio company to evaluate that and allow the entire supply chain to optimize and then companies like Tillable or Camo Ag now will act to integrate that information so people understand which farmlands are producing the best uh, nutritional qualities. That'll lead to premiums on ingredients, uh, new price signals, 
uh, and then more specialty grains and markets. Now we've seen some disruptions. We certainly have been very frustrated with what's going on with Benson Hill, but the shift in Benson Hill that you may have seen is focused more on nutritional density in terms of feed to optimize how quickly pigs and chickens can grow using Benson soy. But you've also seen that they've been able to release and sell off their uh, crush facilities really to the market because people are becoming more specialized in crush and less commodity. And so there's some shifts going on in that market that are, are macro and important. And then that'll lead to improved ingredients, improved nutrition, and improved health and reduced healthcare costs. So that's sort of the roadmap that we're on. Uh, it's not an immediate roadmap. What we've seen in computers, for example, took 1980 till today and was an evolution. There was a way to make money all along the way. Uh, in each one of those episodes, and we're seeing that now. Uh, we were previously more focused around the areas of protein optimization, but now we're focused a little bit more on ingredients, and then ultimately that will, as the market continues to shift and verticalize more towards longevity. But we are a, we're thinking out 5, 10, 15 years in terms of where we're going. Our portfolio today of 70 companies, it really is the roadmap to this future. And it's this is not sort of an egalitarian thing. These are key economic factors that reduce the cost and allow these innovations to occur. Something like a coolobiome uh, uses a microorganism to suck up carbon and, and use that to take nitrogen out of the air and feed it back into the crop system. That allows the farmer to reduce their fertilizer use, improve soil health, improve soil nutrition. And I'm sorry, crop nutrition. You know, these are complex systems being deployed across 300 million acres of farmland. So these are big macro opportunities to make money and save money and improve efficiency, which is what we're after.